Imagine a bridge so important that an entire country's unity depended on it. A bridge that cost around $650 million, funded almost entirely by the European Union, yet built by China. That's right, Europe's taxpayers footed the bill. But when the time came to actually build it, the job went to a Chinese company. So why couldn't Europe's own builders take on a project in their own backyard? How did China manage to deliver one of the EU's most symbolic infrastructure projects? Let's find out in this video. This is the Pel Yaski Bridge in Croatia, a structure that finally connects the country's north and south for the first time in history. On paper, the Pel Yaski Bridge looks like just another infrastructure project. Two and a half kilometers of concrete and steel stretching over the Adriatic Sea. But the truth is, this bridge carries far more weight than its physical size. But before we get to the bridge itself, we need to understand the problem it was built to solve. Croatia's coastline stretches like a long ribbon along the Adriatic, but right in the middle of that ribbon sits a 9-kilometer strip of land that doesn't belong to Croatia at all. It belongs to Bosnia and Herzegovina. This tiny stretch is called the Neum Corridor, and it created one of the strangest border situations in Europe. If you were driving from the Croatian city of Split to Dubrovnik, you couldn't just stay in your country the whole way. You had to cross into Bosnia, drive 9 kilometers, and then cross back into Croatia. That meant two border checkpoints on a single road trip through your own country. In summer, when tourist traffic swelled, this could mean hours of delays. And it was not just tourists. Locals living in southern Croatia were cut off from the rest of their own country. Deliveries, ambulances, even school buses, everything had to deal with border checks. For a country that joined the EU in 2013, this was a serious headache. Croatia couldn't fully integrate into the EU's border-free Schengen zone if its own territory wasn't seamlessly connected. And so the dream of a bridge across the Bay of Mali Stone kept coming back. A bridge that would let Croatians stay on Croatian soil from north to south without ever touching another country's border. There were other ideas too. Some suggested building a tunnel under Bosnian territory. Others talked about expanding ferry lines. But none of those options solved the problem in a lasting way. Croatia needed a permanent link, something that made the south of the country truly part of the whole. Croatia's dream of the Pel Yaski Bridge is not something that appeared overnight. The idea goes back decades, and the first real attempt to build it happened in 2007. Back then, Croatia's government awarded the contract to local firms, and construction crews actually started moving equipment to the site. Plans called for a span over the Bay of Mali Stone that would finally bypass the Neum Corridor. The ground was prepared, some piles were even driven, and locals thought the long wait was finally over. But by 2010, the project collapsed. The global financial crisis hit Croatia hard. Government budgets tightened, borrowing costs went up, and pouring hundreds of millions into a single bridge became politically and financially impossible. By 2012, the construction site stood abandoned, half started and half forgotten, a visible reminder of promises that couldn't be kept. But money was not the only problem. Bosnia and Herzegovina raised objections early on. Their concern was simple. The bridge might block access to their only seaport at Neum. If the clearance was too low, large vessels could be cut off from reaching Bosnian waters. That turned the bridge into a diplomatic issue, not just an engineering one. Engineers later came back with a design that provided 55 meters of clearance under the central span, high enough for shipping lanes. But in those early years, it added friction and delays. By the mid-2010, Croatia knew it couldn't build the Pelyaski Bridge on its own. The financial crisis had left deep scars, and the abandoned start from 2007 was still a reminder of how difficult the project was to fund nationally. But in 2013, Croatia's entry into the European Union changed the entire equation. As an EU member, Croatia could now apply for cohesion funds, money specifically meant to reduce inequalities and improve infrastructure in newer or less developed member states. And in 2017, Brussels made a big decision. It approved 357 million euros, about $400 million, to pay for 85% of the bridge's total cost. The bridge construction itself was valued at around 420 million euros, and when you add the connecting access roads and the stone bypass, the total project cost reached about 550 million euros. 
converted into US dollars. That's roughly $646 million. For Croatia, it was one of the largest infrastructure investments in its history, a figure that shows just how significant the project was for a country of 4 million people. For Brussels, this was not just about Croatia. It was about proving that EU membership comes with tangible benefits. The Pelyaski Bridge would stand as a physical sign that the EU delivers. That integration means investment, not just paperwork and rules. With money secured, Croatia's government was finally ready to move forward. But EU funding came with conditions. Any project financed by the EU had to follow open tender rules. That meant no closed-door deals and no favoritism. Every qualified company, whether from Europe or beyond, could submit a bid. On the surface, this made sense. Open tenders should ensure the best price and the highest quality. But in practice, it opened the door to an unexpected twist. When the bids came in, it wasn't Europe's construction giants that came out on top. It was a Chinese state-owned company, and their offer changed everything. On the shortlist were some of Europe's biggest names, Austria's Strabag, which had worked on countless railways and tunnels across Central Europe, a consortium of Italian and Turkish firms backed by long histories and heavy infrastructure. For many in Brussels, it was almost taken for granted that a European giant would lead the work. But the surprise came when the envelopes were opened. The China Road and Bridge Corporation, CRBC, a state-owned firm under Beijing's Ministry of Transport, offered to build the bridge for about 279 million euros. To put that in perspective, Strabag's offer was nearly 351 million euros, about 20% higher. The Italian-Turkish group stumbled on a technicality. Their bank guarantee didn't meet EU standards, which automatically disqualified them from the race. The price difference was impossible to ignore. For a government and an EU body trying to make sure every euro was stretched as far as possible, CRBC's bid looked irresistible. Of course, it didn't go down smoothly. Straybag and others filed complaints. They argued the Chinese bid was unusually low and potentially unfair, that no company could deliver a two-kilometer sea bridge with massive pylons and European quality standards at that cost without cutting corners or relying on hidden subsidies. Croatia's road authority investigated as required and concluded that the bid was valid and met every technical requirement. Under EU tender rules, there was no legal reason to reject it. So, in early 2018, the contract went to China. For the first time, a major piece of EU-funded infrastructure would be built by a Chinese state-owned company, right inside the European Union's borders. For Croatia, it was good news. After decades of delays, the bridge would finally be built and at a price the budget could handle. For China, it was a strategic breakthrough. The Pelyaski Bridge was no longer just a Croatian project. It became a symbol of Beijing's entry into Europe's construction market, paid for by European taxpayers. Once the contract was signed in early 2018, the real test began. Could a Chinese state-owned company deliver a massive project on time, on budget, and up to Europe's demanding standards? Construction officially kicked off in July 2018, only three months after CRBC won the tender. The site quickly transformed. Barges, cranes, and specialized equipment appeared in the Bay of Mali Stone, and hundreds of workers, both Chinese and Croatian, began laying the foundation. The engineering challenges were enormous. The bridge needed to stretch 2.4 kilometers across the Adriatic, with six towering pylons anchored deep into the seabed. To stabilize them, CRBC deployed the Xiongcheng-1, the world's largest pile-driving barge capable of hammering steel piles up to 130 meters long into the seafloor. That's longer than a football field, just for one foundation element. On top of that, the bridge had to meet strict EU quality and environmental requirements. Every component, from steel imports to environmental protection measures, was inspected under European regulations. CRBC obtained the certifications, satisfied EU monitors, and proved that it could meet the same standards as European firms. Then came 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic. At its peak, more than 700 to 800 Chinese workers were on site alongside local teams. With strict safety measures, the project reported no outbreaks and work never stopped. While other European infrastructure projects slowed or paused, progress on the Pelyaski Bridge continued steadily. 
By July 2021, just three years after work began, the last steel span was lifted into place, connecting both ends across the bay. It was a symbolic moment. Croatia's north and south were, for the first time, physically linked by a continuous road. Less than a year later, in July 2022, the bridge was complete, ahead of schedule. The final structure was not only functional but elegant, a sleek cable-stayed design with white pylons rising 55 meters above the sea, allowing even large ships to pass underneath. For Croatians, it was proof that after decades of waiting, the bridge was finally real. And for China, it was proof it could deliver world-class infrastructure inside the European Union. On July 26, 2022, Croatia celebrated like never before. After decades of waiting, the Pelyaski Bridge was officially opened. And it was not just a victory for Croatia, it was also a showcase of how infrastructure can reshape global influence. Surveys taken after the opening showed something striking. 85% of Croatians knew a Chinese company built the bridge. Fewer could name that the European Union had funded it. For everyday people, the visible achievement was the bridge itself and the builder who delivered it, not the bureaucrats who financed it. That gave China an enormous image boost. In Croatia, many saw China as reliable. The company promised to finish on time and did exactly that, even during a pandemic. For Beijing, this was the perfect soft power story. Forget ideology, just point to a working bridge and say, we deliver. But in Brussels, the mood was different. The European Commission had spent more than 350 million euros of EU money to make this project possible. Yet on opening day, it was China's flag and China's premier on the big screen that seemed to claim the spotlight. The project also set a precedent. After Pelyaski, Chinese companies began competing more aggressively for contracts across the Balkans and Eastern Europe, highways, tunnels, even energy infrastructure. So why couldn't Europe build the bridge without China? The answer is simple, cost and capacity. European firms were priced higher and Croatia couldn't afford them. China offered a cheaper bid, delivered it successfully, and in the process built not just a bridge for Croatia, but a bridge for itself into Europe. However, it leaves a bigger question hanging. As Europe continues to build massive infrastructure, will its projects become opportunities for outside powers to step in? Or will the EU tighten its rules and keep more of these projects in European hands? But one thing is clear, for Croatians driving across the bright white pylons of the Pelyaski Bridge, the geopolitical debates don't matter. What matters is that after decades of waiting, their country is finally whole. But what do you think? Was this a smart move for Europe to accept China's bid, or should the EU have found a way to keep the project in European hands, even at a higher cost? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below.